Hello everybody, welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host every week, and I'm here today with another inspiring guest, Mike Cardoza, who will be telling us about his story as an author and writer of the book, The Secret World of Debt Collection, Beat Collectors at Their Own Game, a former collections executive, reveals how. So Mike, welcome to Author Story. It's great to have you as our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. It's really my pleasure to be here. All right, cool. So to start things off, Mike, uh, why don't you tell our listeners, our audience, something about yourself and your book? Uh, what's your story, and what's the story behind the book? Um, well, to be totally honest with everybody, I never had, I never frankly have considered myself to be um, much of a writer. You know, All I right. I love people. Um, I like to meet people and do things and do new stuff and work in groups and speak and talk and listen and um, although I am an attorney and I have written a number of things most most of them out of necessity you know my passion has been getting in the courtroom and making deals and you know doing business so I had you know for anybody out there that's listening and thinks you know geez maybe I am or am not an author um, let me tell you like it can just sort of happened to you and um, that's frankly what happened to me with this book Uh all right cool so how did you get into uh, yeah you're the CEO of a debt collection company is that correct yeah I mean here's generally what happened Um, after I got off active duty in the Marine Corps um, I started a company with a good buddy of mine that bought and collected on distressed consumer debt uh, we okay. then opened a debt collection law firm. We merged that firm with a large regional collection law firm, and I was the CEO of the debt buying company and the executive VP of the regional collection firm. And so, you know, I was super corporate and spent then like seven years in uh, what is really sort of a fascinating uh, behavioral science industry wow. of okay. the co- distressed consumer debt collection. Right, right, okay. So let's talk a little bit about your book, Mike. Uh, what inspired you to write this? Is there any single incident that you decide, <laughs> I'm going to write this book. You know, I got to write this book. I got to get out it, there. It just fell out, Alex. I mean, it just, um, you know, and it's not necessarily like it had been boiling up inside of me for seven years. Right, okay. Um, but the more I learned about credit and collections and effective collections, um, the more I understood how much the industry, the collection and banking industry benefits from, you know, and this is not pejorative, I'll just say consumer ignorance. Hey, we're all Mm. consumers. Mm. We're all super busy. Um, Mm. We're most of us not lawyers. And, you know, who reads the 57-page, six-point font, terms and conditions of their credit card when they're reissued every four months. Yeah, you know, nobody point, does. Point, so Nobody does. So, right. um, you know, it, it started to really kind of dawn on me that the industry, to, to, to some significant extent, is heavily leveraged on the relative lack of specialized knowledge and financial sophistication of, of its customers, which, you know, creates... Um, it, it it creates some opportunity for exploitation. Okay. Um, it, okay. it just also creates necessarily some um, unfortunate circumstances. And uh-huh. I'm trying to be real careful not to lay blame at the feet of, of either party. But right. I say all this to say that when I ended that life and I came to the, to the life of, um, championing the consumer and representing individuals against debt collectors and banks and creditors and robo dialers um you know there was just a million things i knew they needed to know but didn't and so Mm -hmm. i looked around the internet i looked everywhere for people that had written about this and there was nothing i mean there were a few people hey this is what it was like to be a collector and there were a couple other people that you know, uh, said, here's how you can fix your credit. But there was nobody that, and I know why, there's nobody that came from the industry and said, blah, like, here's all the secrets. This is okay, how it works. Okay. All right. I got that. I got that. 
So, Mike, uh, just to give our listeners of an idea of how things uh, are at present, um, just how big is the uh, debt collection industry? I mean, what are we talking about here? Millions, billions? Oh, no, no, dollars? yeah, with the B. Yeah, okay. billions. Yeah, billions. billions. Um, so, like, um, the, the, the credit card industry, for example, has, you know, virtually taken over every other kind of uh, peer-to-peer lending opportunity. You know, there's no more uh, tabulating what you got at the grocery store and yeah, paying that yeah. guy at the end of the month. I mean, it's been going on for so long, and frankly, it's efficient, and it's right. convenient, uh-huh. and it's um, um, it's powerful, and, you know, there's there's it's done plenty of great things um, for the world economy, but it's been going on so long that we've forgotten even how credit used to be extended. So right. when we hear things like peer-to-peer lending right. or Kickstarter or internet loans or, you know, what's this about like an auto deficiency, you know, we look at it as being something novel because it hasn't yet been totally subsumed by um, the credit card transaction. I mean, you can buy a bag of fries at McDonald's yep, with your yep. Visa card. Okay, I got that. So, uh, would you know? Would you have an idea of how many people you know are own this debt? You know, are in debt? Um, any? Uh, if it's in billions, I presume there must be a couple of million people at least out there who who own this thing. In- yeah, I did some. Uh, I did some. Uh, well, I always had those numbers pretty much at the top of my head, and I did some extra fact finding for my book, which I'm not uh, sitting in front of right now. So, right. the attorney in me is loath to put out the numbers, you okay, know, and, right. and w- without being 100 percent accurate. Of course, okay, um, I but got that. I can generally tell you that um, just about everybody is in debt. Um, okay. Now, not everybody is uh, has defaulted debt, uh-huh. but if you're not you know, if you're if you're not in debt, you know you're 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 kind of not normal. I mean, if you're <laughs> using your credit card to get your Marriott reward points, but you pay it off at the end of every month. I mean, if you go to your um, credit report, you pull it from the consumer reporting agencies. Right. Yeah. You know, boom. You're in debt. You're reporting a trade line. You're borrowing that seven hundred and fifty dollars every month, even though you pay it back. So you might not right. consider yourself to be in debt, but you are using it. it you are using debt, and you're. You're using it wisely. You're using it productively, and that's how uh, you know thousands of Americans have been able to get to higher education and uh, get on the housing inflation ladder yeah. and take advantage of that. And so, uh, yeah, the last thing I would say is that debt and credit are are bad things. I mean, they've built the country. It's uh, mm-hmm. it just a it's it's just a remarkable phenomenon. All right, I got that. Okay, so uh, I just like to address the the issue of debt. I mean, debt has a rather negative connotation sometimes. I mean, debt's like something that's to be bad. Debt is something to be avoided. Um, what what part does this really play in, like you know, as you mentioned, the development of the economy? I mean, what's what is it about debt that makes <laughs> <it> work? <laughs> oh, debt is so good. Um, debt's fantastic. Debt is. Uh, binding people um, together through this, um, you know, common trust that um, if they each sort of are vulnerable to the other, that they both will succeed um, to a greater extent than they could have individually. I mean, that's true for um, the creditor-borrower relationship, and that's true for creditor-borrower countries. I mean, it has international uh, scope, but let me you know hit on something you said there in the beginning. You know what's so right. bad about debt, and here it is. I think it boils right down to how old were you when you got your last lesson about personal debt? You know, I'm guessing mm-hmm. you were probably in about fifth grade, so you were 12. And if you're an American and you went to American school, um, the next thing you studied after either your teacher, or your dad, or your uncle told you. Don't ever borrow more than you can repay, and you right, know, right. don't get in debt because that's a bad thing. Right, right. Um, the next financial thing that you studied was uh, probably like statistics in junior college. You know, something, or or um, yeah, compounding interest rate in econ 101. Uh, Eleven years later, when you were right. in your twenties. So, right, right. the point I'm trying to make is that people have these. And it's no fault of anybody else's except maybe our educational system, which we could all fix. Um, people have this 12-year-old concept of debt. Now, 
MBAs who run companies uh, do not have a 12-year-old concept of debt. They don't have any emotions uh, attached to it. Okay. Um, they have a pretty clinical and scientific approach to it. And any time they merge a company or take one over, they're going to get the accountant to go pull the books, and they're going to whip out the balance sheet, and they're all going to go down and say, okay, how much debt does this company have that we just got? Does it have too much, or does it have not enough? And if it has not enough, uh, then we're – um, we're not taking advantage of um, operational resources that we could easily get at a reasonable price. So let's get out there and uh, get some uh, banking relationships going and get some money in here and start growing this business by using debt because we should be borrowing. Or right. conversely, um, this thing's got too much debt and we can't service it and continue to grow and it's just kind of bogging the whole thing down. So what's our plan? Oh, we're going to reorganize. You know, So let's chop off these divisions and we'll sell these particular assets and we'll break the whole thing apart and we'll uh, restructure our debt. You know, that's a default, right? We're, we're going to restructure. We're going to renegotiate. I mean, that's like basically saying, okay, Chase, you know, you want your minimum payment, but I'm not going to do it because it doesn't work for me. Right. right. And we're going to split the whole thing apart and we're going to maybe bankrupt part of it. And then we'll put it all back together and it's going to work again. And those guys are, you know, they're financial heroes because they just took a cold, hard look at debt and they took the actions that needed to be taken. But people, individuals, just don't have like the emotional capacity to look at their own debt situation mm -hmm. with that same detached reality because once the subject comes up, you know, they feel 12 again, like they're being judged, like something wow. bad's going to happen. Like there's this whole cycle and I'm not trying to take our conversation in a weird direction, but right. okay. it really is the core of, uh, of, um, delinquent debt and collections. There's a whole psychological component that involves like uh, shame and guilt and fear that totally prevents people from seeking out what kind of avenues are available to them. Right. Okay. I got that. Yeah. Well, actually, you kind of answered one of my one of the questions I was going to ask. Because I was going to ask about you know what is it about people when they get into the debt that they and they kind of panic and they kind of wonder what's going to happen next and. You know, when the collector calls up, they're kind of like going, "Oh my, OMG!" You know, what's what's going to happen? So, yeah, thanks for that. I had a client um, some time ago um, who was actually an attorney, and uh, we had gotten in touch. And this guy said, uh, "You know, I've got this old private student loan," and okay. I said, "Oh." I, really and um, he said w what do you think about it this is the advice I've gotten oh you know too bad so sad or you know you got to declare bankruptcy or something like that and I said well uh -huh. have, you know have you heard of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act have you, you know you, uh, yeah, about the Fair Credit Reporting Act how about the TCPA that controls robo-dialing he's like no I haven't heard about any of this stuff and you know I said so hey like here's the legal lowdown I mean these things have been around since the early 70s I mean they're super powerful they they uh, have statutory damages. They pay attorney's fees. There's strict liability. I mean, if the collectors and the credit reporting agencies, like, do something wrong, and there's a whole lot of things they can do wrong, uh, you get to recover some compensation for that, and you right. get your attorney's fees paid. And, you know, this attorney was just totally amazed. And my point is that there are so many laws out there, uh -huh. and – there are so many laws that favor the consumer, and they were written in order to favor the consumer, in order to modify corporate behavior through what we call the private right of action. And I mean, there's the FTC, the uh, Federal Trade Commission, and the uh, CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Yeah, they're out there making headlines, uh, you know, busting J.P. Morgan Chase for 216 million dollars, but that's not a whole lot of money to them. And what? Mm -hmm is not really being reported are all of the private and confidential lawsuits and settlements in the federal courts about the individual collection abuses and robocalls and right. misreporting of credit information. Right. Okay. All right. I got that. Actually, um, your book is very interesting because it covers a lot of a lot of things about this, uh, about, you know, the secret, so-called secret world because a lot of consumers don't know about it. Um, you brought up a couple of thing, a couple of interesting things. One is that you know, like uh, companies and stuff like that, and uh, you know, people getting getting debt. Um, 
would you have any idea what it is you know on the side of companies or creditors that enables them to offer debt so easily I mean I'm thinking like credit card companies like for example roping in kids college kids when uh, these guys don't have uh, capacity to pay yet really any real capacity to pay yet you know the uh, the first thing that popped in my mind was that Tom Cruise movie that features the office of pre-crime you know where in the future we can tell who's predisposed to, mm. to yeah, commit yeah. a crime and who's not and right, right. you know I, I laugh because it's uh, sort of a fantasy but it's really not I mean um, two of the most promising classes of borrowers are the college student with no income okay. and the person who just recently um, completed a bankruptcy. Okay. All right. Yeah, and the reason is because, and this will make perfect sense once I say it, All right. uh, the reason is because the college student is going to get a job that pays more than the non-college student, and he had mm -hmm. All of the parental help and guidance and individual will and fortitude to uh, complete high school in a manner such that he got or she got accepted to college. So those are all really good indicators of a likelihood to repay. And the person who just completed their bankruptcy is prohibited by law from filing another bankruptcy within a certain period of years. I so see, okay. you know that that person is not going to default and get uh, your loan discharged in bankruptcy because they can't. Ah, okay, okay. Well, that that sheds light. That sheds light on uh, quite a few things. Okay, that explains quite a few things. All right, cool. Yeah, am I am I blowing your mind? I mean, it's all sort of. <laughs> common sense stuff, but only when you're looking at it from the perspective of how do I grow my market share. Sure. And, um, you know, I want everybody to understand that uh, defaults for the credit industry are not um, a bad thing. They are a natural indicator of the depth of the market pool. So, uh -huh. you know, like my uncle told me when I was a kid, uh, when you're skiing, if you're not falling down, you're not trying hard enough, which, you know, I thought was sort of perverse at the age of nine. But now, uh, many, many years later, I realize the wisdom of it. And the same applies for um, reaching the depths of your um, uh, market worthy uh, population for loans. If okay. you have a default rate of zero, you don't know how much further into less credit worthy territory you can push uh, until you get to default. And the, the default rate for uh, revolving loans like credit card loans um, nationally is somewhere around three to three and a half percent. So it's okay. just not, and your average credit card balance is like, somewhere between 12 and 12 and 4800 bucks. So mm -hmm. the individual defaults aren't really all that expensive and even when they do default they pay uh these penalties and fees. I mean, the banks get their money back and um all of those defaults are priced into the model. So everybody that doesn't pays for those who do and you know there's no need for the pitchforks to come out because probably uh, one penny of every 10 that you're paying in some sort of fee to them goes to that particular situation and the rest is probably profit, although that's just kind of speaking right off the cuff and I'm not sure it's accurate. Okay. But it's just a minor, 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 minor cost. All right. Okay. I got that. I got that. So so you're saying then that this uh, defaults are really built into the, uh, the system for... Oh, yeah. For, okay. All right. Yeah, you got to have them. You got to have them, or else you don't know. You don't know how many more people you could capture. You know, you don't know how many more people you could lend to, and thereby capture market share away from your other big bank lending competitors. Mm, okay. So the message for the individual debtor, if you're in default, is um, get over it because nobody cares. I mean, you're going to get people who call and. You know, they act like they care, but that's because they're paid to act like they care. I mean, you're just one little account in a big electronic blizzard of millions of other accounts, and uh, nobody really cares. And the in the collection industry is designed to um, get money from the lowest hanging fruit, which is the people that want to pay anyway because, you know, they feel some kind of – they're able to. They feel a moral obligation. They feel some guilt they want to. They know it – or it suits their particular financial um, situation to to pay it off to a collector. That's fine. 
Um, they're not looking for the person to, to grind out the person that disputes the debt, that um, really has an inability to pay. Right. And this is the situation where you get some collection violations because what happens is the collector the collectors are incentivized um, to make a maximum recovery. So, you know, they're right. they're um, I, w- I wouldn't say encouraged, but uh, you know, the forces of nature uh, would suggest that they use uh, the most effective terms so that they can be the best collector, so that they can get the bigger bonus, so that they can get promoted. And we've uh-huh. long recognized what those effective methods are and we outlawed them on a federal level in 1977 in fact one of the core tenets of the fair debt collection practices act is that you cannot as a collector disclose someone's debt to a third party okay and that's because shame um was just such an effective method of collection and it was just uh, unconscionable to the american people which is why congress uh, our congress passed these laws I see. Okay, okay, I got that. So, um, with regards to, like, let's say we're talking about someone who's, you know, uh, in debt, danger of default, then uh, a debt collector calls him up. Uh, what is, and, you know, this guy has had no experience, he's got no knowledge of what goes on behind the scenes and stuff like that. Um, what What is the one thing you would tell him or her when the debt collector comes calling up about their, their debt? What's the one thing they should remember? It's not about you. Okay. It's not at all about you. Don't make it about you. Don't don't do all those things in your head that have got you uh, listening to what this guy guy or gal is saying. Don't when they say like you know weird vague things like well unless we can make a good faith payment today your account will be referred to secondary control. You know wh- right, right. what do any of those words mean? I I don't think. Don't ask me. I don't know. I don't think they mean anything. They're just they're just techniques designed to get the listener feeling kind of uncomfortable and filling in the gaps with their own particular fears. And then that's what causes people to pay. And I'm not saying that mm. paying is bad, but you know, make make a rational choice about it. Don't don't um, don't let yourself get spooked into thinking that you have to do something that you likely maybe probably don't have to do. Right, I got that. So, and um, okay. there's attorneys like um, there's attorneys out there that want to. If you're feeling weird about a debt collection case, or okay. you're feeling kind of harassed and abused, um, there's a whole legion of attorneys that want to review your case for free, and oh, okay. you know tell you whether or not they see something there or they don't. Because the financial model on that is, I mean, a as an attorney, it feels great to uh, give people advice and kind of help them through it, which is why I wrote the book. Um, but B, um, these these laws provide for payment of attorney's fees. So to mm-hmm. the to the plaintiff, to the person, to the debtor, to the person being collected on, um, you know, it's no cost up front to them to have an attorney take a look at their case and then, right. you know, usually even litigate it all the way through trial because those fees will get paid directly to the attorney from the defendant. Right. Okay. okay. So help is out there. Help help is available. We're it's not a big industry and um you know people don't people don't know about us you know they're more familiar with the bankruptcy attorneys and right, the right. debt collection attorneys who are actually yes. collecting the debt but these laws are on your side and there's attorneys that are ready to help you all right i got that i got that okay so um uh, talking about your book i mean i guess i guess this you we brought I mean you brought out your book because you want to help people but you know if if everyone in the everyone in the United States read this book what do you think the impact would be on on people at large and you know spe- on on society at large if everyone well, knew about it very little because um, only about five percent of the population has got debt in default at any one time hmm, okay. So I'm only, you're, you know, 95% of the population is going to say, oh, well, that's really fascinating business case, and maybe I'll know somebody in the future, but that doesn't particularly apply to me right now, which right. is good. And, you know, that ebbs and flows with the condition of the economy. Yeah. Um, I hope that 95% would think, 
Well, good. You know, I'm glad there's guys out there that are spreading the word, and I'm glad that we've passed laws that, um, unfortunately, that we had to pass uh, mm-hmm. to keep people from doing inhuman things to other people in the names of uh, collecting money. Right. Um, but for the for the for the five percent that do have debt and default and kind of struggling with this, you know, I hope it's just a I hope it's just a relief. I hope it's a, a paradigm change. I right. think probably, you know, it'll be a double take, like, wow, um, I've never heard this before. Um, could it possibly be true? Yeah. And I just found myself in the unique position to tell it with a whole lot of credibility um, because it's not a message that your creditors want you to hear. It's not a mm-hmm. message that your um, lenders want you to hear. And it's mm-hmm. not a message, certainly, that your collectors want you to hear. <laughs> you know, that it's all sort of, uh, the, 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 there's quite a bit of smoke and mirrors um, going on in encouraging uh, people that are allegedly in debt to pay. All right, cool. I got that. I got that. So, uh, Mike, speaking as um, as an author, as you know, someone who's interested in things, are there any other topics right now which inspire you that you may want to explore uh, in the future, possibly as maybe as a subject for another book? You know, I really didn't touch on um, credit reporting. Mm. Um, the FICO and that, scores and stuff like that? Yeah, I mentioned it a little bit, um, but I really didn't just sort of glossed over it and uh, chose to focus on collection. I I think I might like to, um, I might like to reveal that world as well because Mm. it's growing. And, you know, we talk colloquially about the credit reporting agencies. Well, they're, they're really not, you know, they're, they're called or the CRAs. And so we get stuck thinking, well, these uh, three big agencies are just um, reporting on credit and receiving credit. Right. No, they're defined in the law as a consumer reporting agency. So it's it's way more than just uh, your repayment on uh, terms of credit. It's right. like information about um, anything um, and, okay. and everything, frankly. And so... The law is really broad, and I think it may have growing application in our concerns about electronic privacy. Mm. You know, there's a yes. degree to which you know we're we're all somewhere along that spectrum of okay, well, you know, I've got my Facebook page, and I've kind of uh, given up being anonymous, and I'm not sure what it was good for anyway, and I've gotten a lot in return for sharing all of my information. But you know, when and where are we going to kind of hit that? hit that wall where a significant number of people decide, you know, there are, there are negative consequences to being completely transparent. And how do I preserve some sort of semblance of this thing that, uh, we used to know as privacy. And so Mm -hmm. I think that's probably, um, something that I'm interested in investigating further and, and, uh, and writing on in the future. All right, cool. I got that. So, Mike, um, in these um, in these closing minutes of this interview, I just like now to ask a few questions that might give uh, our listeners, uh, all of us, some more insight into who you personally are as a person. Would this be okay with you? You know, go for it, Alex. All right, um, cool. Yeah. Okay. If, it, if it's if it's offensive or freaks me out or I don't have an answer, I, well, you don't have you to know, answer that. I just awesome. won't. I, but I'll <laughs> okay. try. All right, I got that. So, Mike, what makes you energized? What makes you excited? What gets you going? You know, for me, and I'm, you know, like I said, it's not necessarily locking myself away in a room and and writing, although I will tell you, and I'll just want to tell all the would-be authors out there, um, if you've got something inside that needs to come out, it will come out, and it will happen like... um, like you were sleeping, like you won't even know what happened. The time, like you slept on an airplane, you you, you took off, uh, and then all of a sudden you were landing. Like that's how your book will come out, uh-huh. um, and it, it's uh, it's really kind of a joy. But for me personally, um, you know, I'm an interactive guy, and uh, I'm just naturally curious. Okay. So okay. I love learning about other people and their stories and their perspectives and. You know their cultures and their attitudes and their values. So I just mm. um, one of the greatest blessings of being a lawyer is that you get to ask the questions. And right. um, 
then there's the opportunity to listen. And I know that's ironic to say because I really have been running the microphone in this interview. <laughs> well, that's what interviews are for, so I got that, I got that. Okay, so let me ask you then, what brings you down? What makes you, you know, blues, blues or brings you down to the dumps? What what really depresses you? What brings you down? I think we do it to ourselves, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fear and doubt, yeah. and it's, you know, we're humans. We're... we're we're physiological creatures, you know. We've got uh, these brain chemicals, and we eat pizza, or we eat broccoli, or you know, we uh, don't drink enough milk, or we right. don't get any exercise, or right. you know, there are all kinds of physiological and just sort of natural um, emotional things happening to us. Right. And what we do with our mind is. We try to make sense of that by rationalizing those things, by assigning a cause um, to them. And so then we build this whole construct in our minds like, well, well, I really feel crappy today because she said that to me. Like, no, you you probably don't. You just, you, you drank too much red wine, so you didn't sleep well, so you woke up feeling crappy, and then you thought about that thing that got said that wasn't very flattering, and now you think that's the reason because... You have an overactive mind, and you have to explain all the feelings that are happening to you. So mm. I would just say that, you know, and I think it's universal, um, I bring myself down, right? Mm. I, okay. I have okay. uh, self-doubt. I have periods of fear, and um, I was so, um, I, I was so, um, boy, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I guess relieved. I don't know if that's a okay. good word, but well, I heard a, an interview by uh, Elon Musk, you know, the the swing for the fences, uh, launch spacecraft, change the face of uh, batteries and cars and the, and the, Euro, the world forever. Uh, and somebody said to him, "Hey, so um, what's your self confidence like? You know, are you just on top of the uh, on top of the moon here with all that you've accomplished? Do you ever do you ever have any worries or anxieties?" <laughs> and he, right, goes, right. he says, "Oh no, you know, I feel the fear all the time. It's mm-hmm. really rather annoying. And uh, I think not only does every entrepreneur or business person feel fear. I mean, I think everybody yeah, who's human yeah. feels fear." True. True. Okay, I got that. So my last question is, if there was one thing and only one thing that you could do for the rest of your life, uh, be it a cause or an activity, you know, an activity like climbing mounts or something like that, um, what would it be and why would you commit yourself to doing that thing? So <clears throat> I'm 45 years old right. um, I, and I'm just telling you these things because I think they're relevant. Okay. Um, I have two kids. I have two young kids. Uh-huh. Um, I've been a lawyer for 20 years. Right. And by far the greatest joy, and, you know, hey, I'll share with everybody, too. I grew up sure. as an only child, so, okay. you know, I have plenty of attention uh, placed on me, and I, I've probably um, been accused of being narcissistic uh, more than once, but I don't think uh-huh. it's accurate. But Okay. I, by far and away, um, the greatest joys that I have experienced are in uh, using whatever kind of natural gifts I've got to help other people. Mm. Um, I think everybody experiences that. Um, sometimes it doesn't really become apparent to you until later in life when you're done worrying about all the other things, like how you're going to feed and clothe yourself and your family. So. Right. If there was one thing, and you know, you realize when you're older too, like, oh, well, not everybody has these particular weaknesses I have, or not everybody has these particular strengths that I have. So Uh as I've gotten older, um, I have realized that I have certain weaknesses that other people don't have. I have certain strengths that other people don't have. But what has brought me the greatest amount of joy, and I think would continue to do so, is to apply my strengths and my gifts in order to help other people in areas where they needed it. And that's really just it. All right, I got that. Well, that's a, that's a pretty good way to go, actually. It's a pretty good way to live your life. Well, thank you for asking the question. I really didn't see that coming, but um, <laughs> that that I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, I got that. So in closing, uh, the book is The Secret World of Debt Collection, Beat Collectors at Their Own Game, A Former Collections Executive Reveals How, the author is Mike Cardoza, and his website is secretworldofdebtcollection.com. That's secretworldofdebtcollection, all one word, dot com. 
So, Mike, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being an author's story. It was a lot of fun and very, very informative. I'm sure our listeners have picked up a thing or two about the ins and outs of debt and all the processes around it. Well, thank you, Alex. I've had a great time, too. Okay, cool. And we'll be back next time on Author Story with another inspiring author.